Hi everyone, welcome to the Positive Post in Conversation. I'm Zazie Todd, author of WAG, The Science of Making Your Dog Happy, Per, The Science of Making Your Cat Happy, and creator of Companion Animal Psychology and the Positive Post. As always, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Christy Benson. Christy, like me, is a graduate of the Academy for Dog Trainers. She's also on staff there, and you will know her as special correspondent to the Positive Post and Companion Animal Psychology. Hi, Christy. Hi. And today we're very lucky because we're joined by a special guest, Jean Donaldson. Jean is one of the world's top dog trainers. She's absolutely amazing. Um, she knows both of us because of us both being graduates of the Academy for Dog Trainers, which is brilliant. Um, you will also know her for her seminal book, The Culture Clash, which is behind me on my bookshelf there, um, and which APDT rated as the best um, number one dog training book and she's also the author of several other books including train your dog like a pro which I recommend to people all the time and also she wrote a course for the great courses called dog training 101 so hi Jean thank you for joining us today oh my pleasure um, so the purpose of the topic of today's show is to celebrate 10 years of companion animal psychology which it's amazing that I started this 10 years ago and at the end of this month, March 22, it's going to be 10 years old. And I was reminded of another life event today by Facebook because up popped a picture of my certificate from the Academy for Dog Trainers, which I graduated from six years ago, which is just incredible. And it was such a fantastic course and I learned so much from doing it. So thank you, Jean. <laughs> Six years. I couldn't believe it was six years. It really seems like, well, it was like three years or two years. I think it's that weird thing, though, because time in the pandemic, it's either like gone in the flash of an eye or it's 10 times longer than it really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I think a lot has changed in that 10 years, even though there's still many more things that we would like to see happen. But one of the things that has really changed is that there's a lot more good information for people. And Jean, you're responsible for some of that. So I thought we'd start with the Academy for Dog Trainers and what you do there um, before moving on to Dog Training 101. So tell me about the Academy and what people learn when they sign up for it. Uh, the Academy is a course for aspiring pet dog trainers. So people who want to teach classes to pet owners, who want to counsel families on problems with their dogs. Um, it's so it's strictly um, people who have companion dogs. It's a two year program. It's probably a, you know, 15 or 20 hour a week commitment. Um, and we try to really give people a thorough and comprehensive education so that when they hit um, you know, they hit the, the market in after their two years, but they're really prepared to do their jobs. Yep. And so Christy knows the program well, too. I think one of the things that distinguishes the academy is the focus on behavior issues and people get a really good grounding on things like fear and aggression, which you don't necessarily find in, in other places at all. Um, and also the emphasis on counseling skills. Um, I don't know what Christy would add to that, but I think it's just an overall amazing program. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I often tell people if they're considering various dog training programs, but if, if dealing with, you know, sort of the thorny issues of dogs that, that are feeling fearful or are behaving aggressively, um, if that's something that they you know, sort of envision doing in their practice, then this is a good program choice for them. But I do think the counseling, like you can't know how to help dogs without knowing how to help people. So I think that the fact that we, we do like a lot of focus on, on, on helping people, but also like how to package up our information so that people can actually absorb it. Um, I think is, is one of the things that the, the school does really well. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. And so then um, for the great courses, you put together a course that's aimed at, I guess, ordinary dog guardians. Um, do you want to tell me something about that? Yeah, I mean, I was, interestingly, I was a fan of the great courses for a long time. I've done a bunch of their courses. I'm a big history fan. Um, and then, so when I was approached to do that, I mean, it's a huge commitment, it's a ton of work, but I think it was well worth it. And so it's a, a 24 lesson 
course for people who are interested in not only getting their dogs trained, but understanding some of the whys and wherefores of what their dog's doing, what, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. And it also troubleshoots some behavior problems. So it's aimed at the lay public, but it's aimed at people who really want to dig a little bit deeper than just um, what they might find, you know, casually on the internet. And so with 24 lessons, you must cover a lot of material. Do you want to give some examples of what some of those lessons are? Yes, there's, uh, there are lessons on um, dog dog interactions and dog play. There um, are lessons on sort of the, the big sort of picture theory of how dog training works. And what are the secrets? So, you know, how, you know, how does this thing, this sort of mysterious thing of motivation, how does that all work? There's um, information on fear, there's information on a little bit of information on aggression, although we we don't want people DIYing that too, too much. Um, and um, there's plenty of obedience. So there's plenty of manners training with lots of demonstrations. Mm. And the videos, you've got some really amazing videos with it, because I've seen the course, you know, you've got some really fantastic video, haven't you? Yeah, they're real pros. I mean, they, they've they been around the block, they've done tons and tons of courses. And so when I got there, I mean, I had to sort of um, uh, invent the content, but they had the dogs recruited, they had sort of the set, they had everything sort of mapped out. Um, and so they really are good at shooting and editing video. Mm. Amazing. So if people want to sign up for that, where do they go to get more information? They can just go to thegreatcourses.com and then put in the search box, just put the word dog and, and, and that course will come up. Perfect. Thank you. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. Brilliant. So that's, I mean, I think that's one of the things that has been changing over the last 10 years and we don't have to stick to exactly 10 years. We can go back longer, but there is so much more information. And Jean, you've obviously made a huge contribution to, to getting much better information out there and getting better qualified dog trainers out there as well. What do you think have been the main changes that you've seen? Well, I have to start by saying um, kudos to you because when I started in dog training, well, first of all, there wasn't the internet, um, but also uh, there wasn't a one-stop shop for authoritative, well easily accessible information on all the science behind methods, behind philosophy, behind the welfare of dogs, the welfare of cats. Um, so companion animal psychology, I mean, in terms of contributions, as he, um, you know, I think that's just, it's where I send people all the time. And now you've got the books uh, as well. So uh, I think that's a fantastic source. And I'm going to take my hat off to Christy as well, who's not only an educator locally, but she's a huge presence now on the internet. She is a blogger. She's doing things for you. She does things for the Academy. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, I, I think that, that we're, you know, uh, I, I couldn't be more proud of you guys. Thank you so much. And I agree completely, Christy, what you put out there is fantastic. Absolutely brilliant, too. So, Christy, what do you think has changed? In the last 10 years, you know, I'm not I don't think I'm necessarily the best person to talk about it because I really only got into dog training because I wanted to mostly help my own dogs to start. And then it's so I, I got into to the academy and decided I liked dog training and I liked the business of dog training enough to do it professionally as well. But I, 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 it's not like I was monitoring. I don't feel like I have like my fingers in that pie. So I, I could say stuff, but I would just be like, I don't know. <laughs> like my own opinion changed so much about how I had to work with my own dogs just because I didn't know anything before, right? Like I, I really did not have a clue. As even though I read like a thousand books, I literally had no clue what to do. <laughs> Until, go, if you go back 20 or 30 years, so not so much 10 years, but if you go back 20 or 30, um, training without the use of aversives was really kind of a fringe movement. Now, I mean, I don't know, somebody needs to, to do a study. Kind of, okay, so what are the various proportions out there that people are, you know, the methods that people are training, but it's no longer fringe. There's thousands now of people um, every day getting the job done without the use of aversives. Um, and I think that's a, I mean, that's such a massive change uh, in, in, and then the other thing I think is that now uh, we have better 
um, counseling skills. So our people skills uh, are so much better than they used to be. And, you know, people entering the profession are, are now very kind of people oriented. Um, they like people, they like coaching people, they have patience for people rather than just patience for dogs. Uh, and they, and as Christy said, I mean, they, they, you know, we give them sort of the skills at how to sort of best package the information and they can take that and run with it because they enjoy the part of working with people. Mm-hmm. And I think, I mean, we're talking about pet dogs, but I think when you look at working dogs as well, some of the things that they do is increasingly with positive reinforcement and reward based methods as well. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. And for example, one of the stories from the science literature about why Greg Burns, Professor Gregory Burns got started on his fMRI stuff where he trains dogs to willingly go and stay still in the fMRI. He tells the story of how he was inspired by military dogs and thinking, well, if you can use treats to train a a dog to jump out of a helicopter and go help capture a terrorist, then, you know, you can use use treats to to train them to go into an fMRI as well. So I think the things that people are doing with dogs is amazing. And also, I don't know if any of you saw the Chihuahua doing Swan Lake at Crufts. But I thought that was absolutely adorable, (laughs) really adorable routine. I mean, there there have been routines like doggy dancing type routines that that people do for so long. And you think of scent detection dogs and all those things that dogs can learn to do. And I just think that's amazing. Um, Yeah. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, yeah, it really, I mean, sort of the, the non-aversive training is kind of infiltrating everywhere. And I mean, I'm hoping that not too far along the road, it'll start to be, you know, made um, mandatory. In other words, there'll start to be legislation, there'll start to be some sort of regulation of dog training, because now we know that we don't have to hurt dogs to train them. So then it really does beg the question, well, then, you know, how can it be okay to hurt dogs to train them? Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. And I think that applies to cats as well, because people um, have some, I mean, people don't really talk about training cats. So it's good that there is a move for people thinking of training cats, but people certainly have used things like squirt bottles to try and stop their cat from doing things. And that's a big no, no, um, that you, you risk like with a dog, you, you risk damaging your relationship with your pet and you risk making them fearful and so on. So I think things have been changing for cats as well. Yeah. Way back in the old days, it was, you know, the, the, the line was that, you know, cats are quote unquote untrainable, but it's just not true. Is it? It's not true at all. And I think it's nice to see people thinking of training cats to be able to do the things that they have to do, like go in the cat carrier, you know, the husbandry training type thing, you know, and actually that's maybe one of the big differences that we've seen in in dog training. And Chrissy, I should ask you about this one. I think about husbandry training for dogs. Do you want to say something about what you and the Academy have done? Yeah, sure. So the Academy was interested in creating. So one of the big um, things I think that distinguishes the Academy in addition to all the other stuff we talked about is the use of training plans and the use not just of training plans but using like a, a really stable methodology in our approach to how we actually get dogs to do stuff so that it, it it becomes something that just like how a surgeon or a mechanic would approach their trade and craft we do the same with dogs so we, you know we just in our pocket we have this ability to be like here's a dog i know how to get to step xyz um so uh the academy identified that there was sort of a need for training plans to help people get their dogs comfortable to go to the vet, both in, on the emotional side, you know, my dog is uncomfortable around the veterinarian and is uncomfortable at the vet's office. And then on the sort of the behavior side, my dog won't hold a uh, position so that the vet can manipulate their body in this way. Um, so the academy created these plans um, and then tested them with academy trainers first. And then with the public, we invited the public to, to test these plans. Um, And we just, you know, so tens and tens of dogs and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of repetitions. Um, We got, by the end, we we were able to sort of crunch the numbers that we got. And we came up with some um, final plans to get people from, you know, either my dog is neutral or my dog is really scared of the vets to my dog is comfortable and waggy going into the vet's office and can hold a position, um, you know, to have a ear exam done or to be vaccinated or, you know, even to, to, to lay down on their back to get um, x-rays done. Um, so all of this is available now. It's available for free. These beautiful plans and, and um, how-to documents are available for free on the Academy's website. 
That's brilliant. And from your own personal experience, you've probably had the same experience as me. It makes such a big difference, doesn't it? To have plans? To, to, to train your dog to be good at going to the vet. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Although I think um, sort of hearkening back to the what's changed in the last 10 years, I think veterinarians have changed their approach to um, how they interact with our dogs and probably cats too. Uh, in a huge way. Uh, and we see that, I see that even for vets who maybe don't have, you know, the same experience as, as like a big city vet um, who's working a lot with behavior. Even here in small town, you know, rural British Columbia, that when we first saw a vet here, she came out and she said, is it okay if I give your dog treats? And she started giving my dog treats. And I was like, I would adore you if you gave my dog treats. <laughs> so yes. Yeah. So yeah, so both things coming together, I think are, are sort of nice and important the change in the veterinary practice and the ability for us to change our, our animal behavior. Yeah. And I think that we did, I mean, we, what we're good at is plugging the gap. So, I mean, there was sort of in the zeitgeist, the, the sort of the general principle of, boy, you know, we don't want, we don't want to just be strong arming animals at the vet. Can we do better by them? You know, and along came fear free. And so there was plenty of general principles, uh, but we plugged the gap of having, okay, so we want step by step, you know, it's good, well to understand the theory that we want this and we should should go slowly and we should go at the animal's pace and we should use rewards, but to put kind of flesh on the bones of, okay, so what's the first step exactly and how it's the procedure and how do you do that? And then to take the plans and then field test them. So we know that they're a, a really good balance of they're efficient. So they're going to get you there as quickly as possible, but they're also incremental enough to capture most dogs. And I think the same thing could probably be done for cats who I think, I mean, I remember years back, I had a cat who was the most phlegmatic, happy, easygoing cat and loved everybody. And he had a single bad experience at the vet where they, they, you know, he just, he became fearful and you no, know, they wanted to give him um, a shot. And so he was strong armed and muzzled and, and held, and he was very shaken up. Uh, and I remember at the time sort of, you know, being sort of very taken aback. And, and I wish in retrospect that I advocated for him better than I did. But I think things were different back then and people just did things differently, didn't they? I mean, it's been a, a good change and uh, to see from Fear Free and from the late Dr. Sophia Yin's work on low stress handling and then for cats for the cat friendly practice program and so on. I think it has made a big difference. But just going back to the training plan. So, I mean, I always through my life have tried to teach cats to go in their carrier, but not in a very organized way, just like occasionally putting a treat in the carrier, trying to make a positive association and so on. And it was only after learning from you about the importance of training plans that I actually went through a proper full training plan with my cats now and although previous cats were they were fairly good at it but actually following the training plan it makes such a difference yeah. you know they're so much better now my current cats than any of my previous cats yeah it makes you think about the various parameters it makes you think about okay so what's the eventual objective where are you starting and then what is sort of a sensible way to get from a to z mm. Yeah, absolutely. It makes you do things properly. So I think that's a good change as well. Do you think there are also changes in terms of enrichment for both dogs and cats and the types of enrichment that people do? Yes, um, I think, you know, that's that, that test kind of, ex it's exploded both on in terms of how much we professionals talk about it and how much we emphasize it. Um, it but it's also exploded in terms of sort of the commercial end. If you went into sort of a pet store, um, you know, in the 70s or 80s, what you would find for sort of dog toys and dog activity things was just a paltry few little things. Um, now, oh my God, I mean, they, they've really got the religion and there's puzzle uh, toys for animals to earn their food. There's all sorts of ideas so you can do these things on your own. There's been the advent of dog parks so that dogs can have normal interactions with their own species, um, all kinds of, of, of things like that. And that's something that's extremely welcome. Shelters now are, I mean, uh, there are almost no sophisticated shelters or no large shelters now who don't consider enrichment to be a huge part of what they're trying to do because their animals are, are not in a home situation. 
Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really important. And as you say, it's nice to just go into the pet store and there are so many different options there. Um, I even did a radio show a couple of weeks ago in which the, the host said to me, she'd been to the pet store and they had all these snuffle mats and they never used to have snuffle mats, you know, know. so she, she wanted to talk about how good snuffle mats are for dogs. No. <laughs> and the great thing is you don't have to buy lots of these things. You can also do lots of it very cheaply or for free because you can make your own snuffle mat. You can make your own food puzzle toys and so on can't you um, Christy what's your favorite types of enrichment for cats so that we get um, on we have to think about cats as well as dogs <laughs> okay. well we recently um after your last um cats webinar Zazie we we bought some I think it was silver vine sticks and Apricot he likes to go crazy for them for a while um and then he sort of gives up on it so I have to hide it away um, but I think my favorite is probably food enrichment. We have little cat treats and I like taking them out and hiding them around on his, you know, on his cat tree and around in his, his little, um, uh, we, he, he has a bunch of elevated spaces just because we have so many dogs. So hiding little treats around for him to find as he sort of hunts his way through his day. But I'm pretty sure he finds his very existence to be the most enriching, <laughs> like coming upstairs and being like, <sighs> I'm, I'm, I'm looking for you, dog, and the communal slap Timber's head. And Navigating the social scene is, is taxing. You know, it's, it's, in, yeah. it's, yeah. And then he, I don't know how he does it, but he ends up on the bed sometimes. And then I was, I was actually going to force you to answer this question earlier, Zazie, but I, it, somehow you escaped it. I was like, how come I can have like a 50 pound dog and then like an apricot and the dog doesn't wake me up, but apricot, who's so small. And I'm just like, I can't sleep. I've got an apricot on the bed. What's That's the really funny. That? <laughs> One of my cats, Melina, she sometimes takes a flying leap onto the bed in the middle of the night. Um, and so sometimes she lands right on my tummy, which is a bit of a rude awakening. God. Sometimes she lands on the other cat, which makes him pretty unhappy as well. So when she decides to do that, it wakes all of us up. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> unfortunate. And it's funny because there was some research by my colleague, Dr. Christy Hoffman at Canisius College a few years back. And she found that people say that cats disturb them more at night than dogs do. And I think the cat is more likely to wander about in the middle of the night and then come back, whereas the dog is more likely to, to stay on the bed. Do you think that's been another change that there's been an increasing acceptance of letting dogs on sofas and on beds and things like that? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we used to be a lot more prescriptive um, in the old days. Um, it was very much dog trainers dictating to owners that they had to have various house rules and various obedience behaviors. Otherwise, you know, some sort of mayhem or dominant struggle would ensue. Now we sort of accept with, you know, just with the caveats of, well, as long as it's not a public safety hazard, and as long as the welfare is okay, um, people can live with their dogs pretty much the way they want. You know, we're going to help them because they want their dogs to be happy. They want their dogs to sort of have fulfilled lives um, and they want their dogs to not be a nuisance in the ways that they define is a nuisance. But if they want the dog on the sofa, they want the dog on the bed, it's totally fine. Um, in fact, it's, you know, we can kind of, we get sort of the pleasure of granting them permission because sometimes they think the dog trainer is going to wag a finger at, finger at them and, and we don't do that anymore. Yeah, and I think that's such a relief for people to hear sometimes, isn't it? And then something else that you you just touched on earlier, but maybe you'd, you'd like to say something more about, you talked about social interaction and we were thinking of Africa and the dogs, but between dogs and the dog park and those opportunities for social interaction, why is that so important? And should people be doing more to give their dogs those opportunities and cats? Yeah, I'm going to jump in because I, it's something that just makes me crazy when there are blanket statements such as, oh my God, dog parks are, are dangerous and bad and destroy dogs, you know, and it's, you know, I find that very, very sort of, you know, um, off-putting in, in a number of levels. Um, occasionally sort of, you know, a dog might have sort of not a great experience at a dog park, uh, but for the most part, um, dogs are are there because they enjoy the company of other dogs. They're navigating the social scene. It's terrific exercise. And if you think about it, so, it, it, you know, uh, the, if you think about like the five freedom, freedoms for animals that we sort of want, you know, so a chicken that is destined for a dinner plate um, is entitled to 
be able to engage in species and normal behaviors. And that includes for a social species, having conspecifics, having members of their own kind. Dogs are highly social. They're interested in, a, you know, unless we really drop the ball, they're extremely interested in other dogs. Most dogs, when they're young, they enjoy playing with other dogs. And to deprive them of that, um, I think is, is just sort of a, a flagrant, um, you know, kowtowing to one's own fear that what if, you know, what if something terrible happens? And I think that any professionals that fan those flames should be sort of, you know, you know, sort of brought to, you know, had the, what's the expression, their feet to the fire um, for, for doing that, you know, that, that, that it's not well supported. Um, and it might be because they themselves have, I think they've had a bad experience, or they know somebody who thinks they've had a bad experience. Um, and occasionally, you know, there are mishaps, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a, I think we need to weigh up sort of the cost of a blanket banning of, of dogs from interacting with their own species with the occasional dog who does have a bad experience. And I think that can also be mitigated if we're thoughtful about how we socialize dogs, where we scan dog parks and, you know, and sort of the etiquette that, that we employ. So I think that it is a basic right of dogs to have interactions with their own species. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think, uh, you know, play for puppies in puppy class is an important way of making sure that, that puppies get used to being around other pups and they learn their good social skills too and I think it's a bit different with cats because many cats would actually be quite happy being the only cat it does depend a lot on the socialization they've had as a kitten and their early experiences so some cats are very sociable with other cats and with other animals um, Christy and I both have cats and, and cat and dogs in the same home um, but some cats really would rather not and would rather be the only cat and I think that's something else that people perhaps should have an increasing awareness of um, and, and and I think they do because they realize that cats don't necessarily want another feline friend it, it depends very much on the cat yeah my, my I would had a question because I'm thinking as I you know when I edge towards retirement that I'm going to um I'd like to have a cat again uh, and my thought was if I you know if it's kitten season which we have here we have kittens in abundance my thought was to adopt two litter mates and I think is that is that becoming a thing now where that's actually kind of if you've got two litter mates who are already bonded that's kind of good to adopt them out together Yes, and actually there are some rescues and societies now that don't like to adopt singleton kittens, they like to adopt kittens together because they keep each other company and they learn from each other and yeah, it's, and it's good for them basically yeah. to have that company then so it's much better whereas if they go out as just the one kitten they're not likely later on to be wanting to accept other cats. So, yeah, 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 that's good to know. Yeah, that's a, a really good thing to do. And then the other thing is that sometimes there are adult cats that are bonded pairs or even bonded trees that, that can go to a home together too, which is, is nice yeah. as well. If you know that yeah. you want more than one cat or kitten, it's best to get them at the same time. <laughs> yes, I, 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 you know, when I watch YouTube videos as I want to do, one of the things I love, what I love watching cats interacting you know, when cats are, they elect to sleep together, they elect to groom each other. That just, it just says something for the heart that is, you know, oh, I love it. It's so sweet. It really is. Yeah. And I think not everyone has that. I mean, cats that haven't grown up yeah. together might get on together. Right. Okay. But, but not be quite so close or not cuddle quite so closely, but again, they can learn and um, they can learn to get on with dogs and to, to, to lick the dog for example to wash the dog um melina used to have a thing when we still had bodger she would creep up on him when he was sleeping and she would go and she would sniff him and he would just jump out of his skin <laughs> um, <laughs> so he would be like scared and i would have to warn him that she was coming but at other times she was really happy to go and greet him it was just when he was asleep that she was she would have this thing that she wanted to go and <laughs> go and see him then and he would be scared other times you know as you know from the companion animal psychology logo it shows them sniffing noses they they were good friends yeah yeah so i mean we talked about some of the changes that have happened i'm going to ask each of you about what changes you would most like to see in the future for dogs and or cats so I'm going to start with Jean if that's all right what would you most like to see happen um, I think I would like to see uh, some 
at least beginning of regulation of dog training um, so that some of the more egregious things. So for instance, um, somebody who is convicted, um, you know, cause now, you know, videos go viral. So, you know, some trainer is caught on video and we have proof of them being abused, abusive towards a dog. And they're convicted of that, that they are not then permitted to continue to be a dog trainer, that they cannot continue to take money for hire. And, and even that they may be prohibited from having a dog in the future. That would be a good start. And then it would be nice to sort of start to see some of the more egregious aversive tools, such as electric shock, um, just taken out of circulation. I know that's sort of easier said than done. And I know there's going to be pushback from, um, you know, from uh, the companies that produce them to people who use them for various uh, things. I know there will be pushback, uh, but it, I think it's an idea whose time will come. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, um, that people who sir, are still using them, that they decide that they're going to give it up before they're legally obligated to do so. Um, that it really is as simple as we don't need to electrically shock dogs to train them any more than we need to electrically shock babies or children or cats or sloths at the zoo. We don't need to electrically shock animals. Um, and so we need to just plain stop doing it and stop euphem stop the euphemisms, stop the, the apologists, uh, it, just stop it all together. So I'm thinking that might be something that, that we'll see in our lifetime. I, I agree. I mean, I hope we do see it. I, I, obviously, I, I come from England and there have been talk there's been talk about banning shock collars and I think it hasn't finally passed into law yet, but you know, it's kind of in the works and hopefully at some point it will. And then hopefully it also will come to Canada and the US where, where we are based because right. it would make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And Christy, what would you pick as your top thing for this top yeah. change that you would like to see? Well, mine's probably a little bit more subtle, but I mean, I think I would like to see a continuation of the sort of the trend that I think we're seeing now that we're riding. It's just like, dogs are going to be dogs and it's okay that we delight and allow them and give them opportunities to be this way so instead of seeing dogs as you know maybe if i look back like to my own childhood or before then where dogs were like created for our purposes and our use and our enjoyment and 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 to fit into into a really specific sort of box instead of just being like actually here's the dog that we have and look how cool they are and let's learn about them and let's let them do the things that they naturally enjoy and that you know so instead of it just being this like worried human reaction of oh my god my dog's being a dog instead of being like wow this is so great and I think we're seeing that I think it's really cool it's really fun to to sort of see that come up and it's a way more fun way to live with dogs if, if you you know if you're like that it, <laughs> like is, it is yeah. it really is you know I want to just sort of you know say that had you, I think, 30 years ago, Zazie, tried to market to a publisher the idea of a book that's not on how to control your dog, how to get your dog to do what you want, how to prevent the dog from ascending in an imaginary hierarchy, etc., but a book on how to fulfill your dog, how to make your dog happy. What's the science behind dog welfare, dog happiness, dog fulfillment? That would have been a tough sell 30 years ago. But the fact that it is, first of all, brilliantly done, but second of all, that it was leapt on, that publishers want that and that the public wants it and people are reading it and people are loving it. It does show to me that there is a change in the zeitgeist, that now the badge of being a good dog owner or good dog guardian is no longer that you're dog is under control and that you have you know your master of the universe it's now is can you meet your dog's basic needs and it's not just the physical needs can you make meet your dog's behavioral needs and that's just such a wonderful development so i think i, I you know i think i'm going to change my vote to, <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to, I don't what christy wants <laughs> we're allowed to want all of them <laughs> yeah but I, I, I mean, I think it's a, a really good change. And, and I will just say that very occasionally someone will send me an email or a note on social media and say, and try to tell me that it doesn't matter if your dog is happy, they just have to be obedient. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, and it surprises me still that, pe that there are still some people that think this. And I think it is a wonderful change that most people, they do want their dog to be happy. And that's why they've got a dog or a cat, 
because they want them as a companion and they want to know how they can give them a fulfilled life. They do care if their cat or their dog is happy. And I think that's a, a really wonderful thing. Yeah, so that's good. So I think I th like from just looking at my clients and sort of extrapolating back in time, I think people probably always have, many people probably always have secretly enjoyed their dogs and let their dogs on the bed and let their dogs jump up on the kitchen table and laugh I at felt it. guilty. Yeah, but they felt guilty. And so here we are, we're able to come in and be like, guilt no more, you know? And they're like, oh my God, I love this dog trainer. She's saying that things that I'm secretly letting my dog do yeah. is kind of bad about it. It's, yeah. it's actually, it's actually enriching. <laughs> yeah, you can just drop the guilt and enjoy your pet and your relationship with your pet. I yeah, think that's, that's a wonderful the thing. Whole, the whole great thing about dogs is that they're not us. You know, yeah. they're, they're them. Yeah, yeah. I think what I would like to see more of, and it ties in with what Christy said about letting dogs be dogs, but it applies to cats too. And that is more enrichment, uh, more things for them to do, especially for cats, because so many cats are indoors only and they don't have very much to do. Um, and they can very easily get bored or frustrated if they don't have the things they need in their environment. So I think en enrichment and more enrichment for them is important important and I think it's really great that these days if you want to you can train your cat to be a trick cat you can get them a trick certification just like you could with your dog and yeah. you can do a feline nose work course with them if you want to just like you would with your dog you know the the difference being that you've done it in your own home so I think that's a pretty special thing that people can do and I think there'll be more of that and I think that'll be nice to, so that cats won't just kind of be ignored and petted and then not have anything else but they'll they'll have play opportunities and opportunities to use their nose and their brain and things like that as well and have you noticed that more people I and mean, it first it was sort of a novelty thing but now it's more and more that people are building kind of enclosures where the cat can be outside but safely so they're in sort of a you know a, 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 I don't want you know the cage is the wrong word but it's kind Cassia. of what it is yeah, yeah I think that's it's like an aviary but for cats uh, and I love that idea I love that idea too I wish I could afford to build one for my cats because my <laughs> poor cats are stuck indoors only and you know in England, cats much more often are allowed outside. And in the past, I would have said it was cruel to keep cats indoors. But of course, it's not safe here to let my cats outside. There's too much wildlife that just get eaten by coyotes, sadly. Yeah. But yeah, catios that make it safe for cat to be outdoors. Or even if people leash train their cats, if they have a cat yeah. that would like to go on walks, I think yes. that's nice. Cats too. on harnesses, I love it. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> As someone who has dogs who outside are less pleasant to cats, I would I would worry if that were me in a city and then there was a cat on a leash, I would find that interaction really I'd just cross the street, I guess. Right. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, oh. yeah. 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 I think you have to be in the right neighborhood because I live somewhere where some people just let their dogs roam and they would not be safe for cats. If you were just walking down the street, you'd have to be able to quickly pick up your cat and push them into a carrier or something. Right. But I think in a city where dogs are used to seeing all kinds of things around and, and they're more socialized to that it's much safer for cats um, and especially if the dogs are on leash anyway and, and under control from, from that perspective then the cats are safer yeah yeah safety is always important yeah are there any final things that you would like to say about how things have changed or how things should should change in the future Oh, I think, you know, I, I, I'm actually very encouraged by all the trends that we're seeing, one in sort of letting dogs be happy, letting be dogs, um, the uh, emphasis on enrichment, and the, the ever increasing trend towards helping dogs fit into our lives without hurting or scaring them. I agree. Yeah, definitely. I think things are definitely going in the right direction. And it, it makes me happy to see these changes. And I'm sure it makes you happy as well. <laughs> it seems to feel like you're on the right side of history. Totally. Really yeah, yeah, totally. It does. OK, so we'll move on to the section where we talk about books. Um, and as always, I'm going to start with the book club book. And then I've asked each of you to have a book and I've got another book to share as well. So this month, the book club is reading Life's Edge by Carl Zimmer and it is fantastic. I'm only part way through because we're only halfway through the month but it is really amazing. Um, Life's Edge, the search for what it means to be alive and it makes you realize that you think you know what alive is but it's much more complicated. <laughs> 
than you thought. And it's complicated in a philosophical kind of way, but it's also complicated in a scientific kind of way. Like for example, he's got a section where he goes to a lab and he sees they've, where they've, they've grown brain organoids in the lab. So they're like little, little brains, but obviously not attached to any animal or anything like that. So are they alive or are they not alive? Um, that kind of question. It's got a really interesting bit about snakes. So, I mean, it's an animal book club and this book is obviously, it's not about any specific animals. So that makes it a bit different from what we usually read, but it has obviously lots of animals in it and it's fascinating and it's really well written. Like he has a really good flow through it. So you finish one chapter, you really want to go on to the next chapter and find out what's happening. So it's, it's, it's really brilliant. I'm really enjoying it so far. Yeah. Carl Zimmer has got the kind of curiosity that sort of kind of emanates out from every page of everything he's ever written. And he writes about the natural sciences better than almost anybody in the universe. I mean, he's just brilliant. Yeah, well, I think you would like this book, Jean. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. Yeah. So, Jean, what book have you brought to share with us? Well, my book is, you know, it's a bit more of a tangent, but it my book is called The Anglo-Saxons by Mark Morris. Um, and I, I, I mean, it's the one that I've just finished. And I wanted to mention it for a couple of reasons. One is that it is about behavior. So um, my sort of side interest is English monarchs. And this book fills a particular gap, the gap between sort of the, the end of the Roman occupation of Britain and the advent of the Norman conquest where it becomes sort of, you know, much sort of more documented history. And Mark Morris um, fills sort of that, that kind of 600 year gap. Um, but also he makes really good point about sort of the, there's been a co-opting um, by sort of despicable racists of the term Anglo-Saxon. And, and Morris goes out of his way to sort of say, you know what, there's nothing, you know, special or superior or anything about this is just basically a descriptor of people from a couple of parts of the world who went and settled. Um, in Britain. And then here's the history of that. It sort of, and it sort of, you know, debunks this idea that it's anything sort of, you know, more than just a particular ethnic group. And there's how, what they did and where they went. And the other thing, of course, is it's because of such jostling, you know, for power and kingdoms and how that works. And it, it really all ends up being about behavior. And so um, uh, that's the book I just finished. And he's a marvelous writer as well. That sounds fascinating. I, I'm going to have to get that one now. That sounds really, really good. Thank you. Christy, what have you got to share with us? So I, um, I actually was going back this week <clears throat> to a book that um, you guys have both heard me speak about before. So it's called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown, Henry Rodiger, and Mark McDaniel. And uh, the reason why I like this book, so I'm, I'm, I have some online courses. And because I'm trying to educate people through my online courses and because I really only have people's attention for a really short spurt of time. Um, so I wanna make sure that I'm educating them in a way that's gonna help them remember as best as possible with the least amount of effort on their part. So it's, it's important to me that I'm doing that as well as I can. I don't want them to walk away and be like, oh, so dog. Yeah, I want them to be like, so I'm gonna X, Y, Z and then my dog's gonna, you know, ABC and this is awesome and I, yeah, I love this, this is great, right? $30 well spent, like that's what, so I'm, I'm trying to, to make sure that I, when I prepare the courses, I'm doing it in such a way that it's really going to hammer points into people's brains without them knowing it and without them feeling like I'm hammering, you know? So I like this book because it's written more for how can you help yourself learn, you know? But it's, there's also like, how can educators just do better at educating? So all of this sort of, so I'm trying to ponder like, how can I best, you know, um, use, quizzes at the end of course and and how can I debunk in my own brain the things that I've learned about how people learn which are just wrong you know like rereading isn't helpful it doesn't actually help you at all it's just a humongous waste of time so it, this kind of like how can I best educate people in, in the least amount of effort and time for them is so I, I've come back to this because it is just based on a ton of science it's shockingly well written and it's easy to remember <laughs> on a meta level because they know how to make you remember stuff. So I've been touching base a little bit again, just about, you know, for that. So I love this book. Super interesting for anybody who educates. It's just fascinating reading and it's easy and, and it's interesting. Brilliant. That sounds really good. I will, I, will, I think I would like 
to read that one too. And then <laughs> so the book that I've got to share that I'm reading at the moment, I haven't quite finished. It's called Alphabet Alphabet um, by Sadiqa de Maya. So it's um, um, its subtitle is A Memoir of a First Language. So she spent her childhood in the Netherlands and then immigrated to Canada. So it's kind of about um, Dutch and English and language. And I'm always interested in things to do with linguistics and language. So it's really good from that point of view. And also she's a poet, so it's very poetic. Wow. So it's it's kind of a memoir and it's written in short sections about language. And it, it even starts with a bit near the beginning about what people think Dutch sounds like as a language. Um, and I can't pronounce any of it right. There are some Dutch Dutch words in here, which they don't call Dutch. It's Nederlands. Oh, I probably pronounced it wrong anyway. But um, so it's it's really interesting. And it's not just about language, but kind of about what language means. So the colonial roots, the colonialism that goes along with language and that kind of thing as well. <laughs> and interwoven with the experiences of moving from the Netherlands to Canada and what it's like. And then what it's like, again, to go back to the Netherlands and, and visit. So I guess for me, that's interesting because obviously I'm an immigrant too. And I, I, it's there isn't the language dimension, but there is still that experience of what it's like to go back and things have changed and it's not how you remember so it's just it's a really really interesting read and I, I'm really enjoying it and it's an it's a short read it's only a very slim little book and each bit is in short section so it's easy to dip in and out of but in each bit it's like it's just brilliance <laughs> every single little section it's just brilliance it, it, because it's because of being although it's text it's it prose it's kind of poetic as well so it's just really really enjoyable to read so yeah I, i'm so it really piqued my interest i'm also so excited to see like we're holding up physical books you know i know that a lot of people get you know, they get um you know sort of tablet type reader devices uh but but i'm going to go down fighting on like i love like a physical like a like a paper book you know and um you know it's one thing that would make me march on washington among others is if they they threatened to do away with real books. Yeah, me too. I, I really love the real book. And I don't know, it just somehow feels nicer holding up the actual book than than holding up a screenshot of the, <laughs> the cover of the book. <laughs> Absolutely. So Jean, thank you. The odd man out. I read tons of ebooks. The vast majority of books. And I well, love then it. thank oh. you for finding an actual physical yeah. copy to hold up. Yes, yes. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I was like, oh, I got to talk to Zazzy in five minutes. Better go find a, one of the books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Jean, for coming to chat with us today. It's been a real pleasure. If people want to know more about you or about Dog, Trainer, Dog Training 101, where should they go? Uh, they should go to thegreatcourses.com uh, and just type into the search bar uh, dog or dog training, and they'll be taken right away um, to that course. Brilliant. And thanks for thanks for inviting me. It's been such fun. It's been real fun. And they can also find you online at the Academy for Dog Trainers dot com. That's right. Yes. Anybody who wants uh, inter is interested in the Academy. Perfect. And Christy is at christybenson.com and you can find out more about me and also about the positive post and subscribe to the positive post at companionanimalpsychology.com. And thank you very much for listening. If you've liked this, please hit the like button and subscribe to make sure that you get future episodes. Thank you.